excited when things don't go the way I plan. Preachers try to walk the talk. I talked about practicing the presence of God based upon that wonderful little book by Brother Lawrence from many, many years ago about how to look for God's presence in the ordinary of our lives. Let me back up to last week. Even before that, I always had a dream of getting a very specific kind of dog to become a therapy dog to travel with me to visit nurses' homes and hospitals. I wanted a male, silver, standard poodle. I knew that one day that would happen. I happen to have two dogs right now, a white and a black standard poodle. I think most of you know that. They're not up for therapy. They would make people zany if they did their home. But in this case, I thought if it ever happens, I'll do it the right way. I'll get the right dog and I'll train him and it'll be part of my ministry because I always wanted to hear it. And we're not in a position at the church that I don't need to hire a full time spirit. But we can start with a dog. And he'll accompany me and he won't talk back. So, again, I thought several years from now this could happen, and then Tara, by prompting from the Holy Spirit, got on this and basically asked me that there is one available right now. I thought, well, I'm not really ready for it yet. The more I prayed about it, the more it seemed right. And the only hitch was I had to fly down to Orlando to get them because you can't ship dogs during this time of the hot year. I thought, well, Jeff Blue has reasonable rates. Let's do it. So I flew out of Westchester on Wednesday to get my dog. The plan was I'd come back the same day. But there was a problem with the ticket, and I ended up being scheduled to come back the next day. So I thought, okay. I called the breeder, and I said, can you delay the day? I'm, I'm going to be one more day in Orlando. And she said, that's fine. I'll have to switch a few things around, but that's not a problem. So my next question was, what do I do with myself in Orlando for 24 hours since I don't know anybody? And I thought, well, I actually know one person. The bishop of Central Florida, who was my professor during seminary and who was my spiritual director, who actually gave me a lot of guidance before this call and here St. Paul gloriously unfolded when he was in New York City as a parish priest before becoming a bishop. And I thought, you know, bishops are notorious mm -hmm. dudes. There's just no way he'll be available, but I'll give it a try. So I sent him a text, and he wrote back, and he said, I actually have one hour for lunch I need. And I thought, this is great. This is unheard of. So we went out to Orlando, took a cab downtown, he said, meet me in the Citrus Club, which is some fancy restaurant it's on the 18th floor. I think it's like the highest building in Orlando. Mm -hmm. So I'm up there in the Citrus Club with him. It was a great hour together. I'm looking out over Orlando, trying to look for Disneyland. Can't quite see it. I know it's out there somewhere. And once the lunch was up after an hour, which was just a great experience, I went down the elevator and said goodbye to him. And he went back to his very busy schedule. And I'm standing on the streets of Orlando on a very hot afternoon, not quite knowing what to do now. And I thought, God, I'm fine. I'm here. Practicing the presence of God. I thought, all right, God, so what do I do next? Well, I thought about how to get a cab to take me back ahead of time. So I called the cab company, and they indicated that they can take me from the airport to downtown. They don't have cab service. But they'll call me if they can find somebody. So I waited about an hour. And as I waited on the hot streets of Orlando, which is a rather nice city, people passed me by. And oddly enough, several people stopped and engaged me in conversation. Now, I wasn't wearing a collar. I was in a city this was in, sitting on a bench. And one young man in particular stopped and he said, nice shoes. <laughs> and they weren't that nice. And I thought, well, thank you very much. He said, I'm, I'm new in town from Iowa. I thought, really? I said, I'm not from here. I'm just here for the day. You wouldn't believe my story. I won't get into it. But I'm here for a dog. And so we talked for a while and he told me about his life. And I told him I was a pastor because people always want to know what you do. And with that, I offered a prayer for him. Not with him, but silently. Because when we don't know what else to do with the world for us, which is always hungry, spiritually, we pray. We can always pray. So I prayed for him. One other guy, ironically, stopped and asked me for directions. I said to him, again, yeah, I have no idea where I am. <laughs> but I prayed for him. And after an hour, I realized the cab is most likely not going to come. So I looked down the street, and just a block away, I had noticed before with big time, it said, Information Center. I thought, well, how about that? I need information. So I walked in and opened the door and the blast of air conditioning hit me and it felt great. And there the person was behind the counter and said, what can I do for you? I said, I need to figure out how to get to the airport. And she said, well, there's a bus right across the street that comes on the half hour late right to the airport. I thought, that is great. So I crossed the street. But before I 
point is that I saw a black town hall with one of those stickers on the back like you see here in the city. And I looked through the window and he looked at me and I asked him to roll down the window and I stayed in the middle of traffic and he rolled his window down. I said, are you car service? And he said, no, excuse me. He crossed the street, decided I better wait for the bus. So I waited for about a half an hour and while I waited a man came up to me who was home with SUV and began to engage me in what I would call hostile conversation. Vigorous fellowship in the negative sense. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not going to make eye contact with them. I've been an urban parish priest before. I've dealt with homeless people. I know how this works. I'll pray. And as he continued to let out a verbal tirade of around me and at me and over me, and I knew it wasn't personal, it was spiritual, I prayed. Bless him. Bless him. And that went on for almost half an hour as I waited for this bus to get there. Practicing the presence of God. Well, a bus did come, but it wasn't mine. But the glorious thing is that this individual decided to get on the bus. And I thought, great, thank you, God. <laughs> so he got on the bus, and about 15 minutes later, my bus came, and I got on the bus, and I sat down. We started going through the streets of Orlando. And then about three blocks later, the bus doors open, that hydraulic sound, you know, shh. And who steps on the bus and looks right at me? My friend. <laughs> Doesn't pay fare. I'm thinking, how does this guy ride the bus system without paying fare? Well, he, he looks at me and thinks, ah, there you are. <laughs> he sits down next to me and starts ending it. I'm not praying. But it gets more interesting. We stop a few blocks later and the, the doors open and there's a man on the street corner who's brandishing a weapon and is arguing with the bus driver and calling him all kinds of names. And the bus driver is calling his names back and I'm thinking to myself, I only came to Orlando to get a puppy to land. <laughs> this is this about? Appointment. I don't know what is going on, but it's good. I'm riding through Orlando, praying. It's like a prayer walk, but I'm on a bus. It's a prayer ride. In Orlando, we did prayer. That's what I concluded. So I'm praying. And fortunately, the bus rolled on, and the man brandishing the weapon continued to scream and yell, but we eventually lost sight of him. I thought, why is the bus driver in the But I won't ask. I'll pray. So I picked the bus driver. Finally got to the airport. Blessed the bus driver. Blessed everyone on the bus. My homeless friend included went into the airport, and I reserved a room at the airport because that's where I was picking up the puppy. There's a Hyatt in that airport, and so I checked into my room, and there was this nice quiet room. I thought, okay, finally. The crowds have gone away, just as the disciples wanted from our story this morning. I can be by myself <laughs> and relax and pray. So I look out my window, and there's the airport with the airplanes. I can't hear anything. You can just see it. It's a very quiet room, and within 10 minutes, Someone checks in the room next to me, and there starts the salsa music. Like a dance party. I mean, pounding loud. And I thought, I'm going to switch rooms. So I called the front desk, and I had my room switched within 15 minutes. It's great. So I go into my next room, open the curtains, and this time the room's on the other side of the airport, and out the window is the concourse inside the airport with probably 300 people yelling, talking, yelling about going to security. And I thought, I've never seen a hotel room that looks out. I thought, there goes my quiet time. In some ways, it's louder than that room. <laughs> I thought, clearly, I'm being called to pray for humanity. The masses. God has a mission for me here, beyond just the mystery life. Practicing the presence of God. Well, I won't bore you with the details, but I prayed for you, for this parish, for my family, for people that I could see out the, the glass that God put on my heart. It was really interesting. It's like a continual intercessory movement. Now, I knew what was on CNN if I'd chosen to turn on that television in the hotel room. Endless coverage of Gaza and all other conflicts in the world, which were always present and always on a continual reel. But I didn't bother doing that. I knew what was going on. I included that in my prayers. And I thought about our text for today, knowing what sermon would be coming, which is the feeding of the 5,000, which every gospel tells about, yet each in its own way. The main point of this story that Jesus miraculously feeds probably 25,000 people in one day. The disciples initially don't want to have anything to do with the crowds. They want them to go away. Notice Jesus had been by himself and then was essentially moved with compassion to embrace the hungry of his heart. And as disciples, the lesson for us, I believe, is that as we practice the presence of God, we have to be ready for anything 
including feeding the thousands around us. But the only way we can truly do that consistently is by prayer. Sometimes we have the privilege of literally helping someone with food or sustenance or provision, but one thing we can always be certain about is prayer is the key to the Christian life. If you look at John's account of the feeding of the 5,000, mm-hmm. after Jesus feeds the multitudes, then he starts to say some hard sayings to the disciples. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He talks about himself as the food that endures, as opposed to the food that goes away. And one by one, people peel off. If he can't give them what they want, they're not interested. At least that was the case with a lot of them. Yet some stay, some that we might call the remnant, the church, those that Christ John 6 gives an interesting account of this from a different perspective. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus has been described as a window into heaven, and a window where heaven looks into the world. And I thought as I stood behind that glass that separated me from the converse, that's just glass. There's really no separation between us and raw humanity, teeming with life and desperation and hunger and need. What can we do? Trust that God will give us the divine appointments that God has planned as we practice the presence of God. The next day, after getting my puppy, who's was doing wonderfully well, by the way. It's kind of like having a toddler. We've been, not up all night, but certainly active in a way that we have been. As I got on the plane with the dog, feeling really excited, a woman sat down next to me on the plane, reading a book about Christianity. You could see that she was somewhat new at this, although she was probably quite advanced in years. She was definitely new spiritually, one could sense it. Of course, she asked me what I did. I said, Well, I'm a pastor. And I have these stories about airplane evangelists and airplane seats. I guess it's because you have a captive audience, but you may remember Steve Winfeld, the canon from the Diocese of San Diego, who came to us years ago and talked to us. He had a number of people he converted as he put it on airplanes when he worked for Ivan. I've never seen myself until I've done roles, but I did find myself essentially put into a position of giving testimony about why I was there, what was happening, what I do, who I am. And she listened, and then kept reading her book, and I prayed. I didn't want to talk the whole plane ride, I wanted to pray. So with my puppy at my feet under the seat, I closed my eyes and I prayed for her. And then as we landed, the jet blue pilot announced that we were in Westchester, and then he said, God bless you all. And she looked at me and she said, did he say that? I said, yes, I think he did. A perfect way to end a very interesting trip as I sought to practice the presence of God. But I must tell you, like the disciples, there were moments where I thought, make all this go away from me. I had a plan. I had a schedule. What's going on here? Why am I being led in these places? Well, God has reasons we can't understand. And that's the thing about divine appointments. We don't always know what they're about. It's like a, a pebble. If you go in the water and it ripples, those ripples do affect areas of water you can't see at some point. And that's the way it is with our lives as we respond to the leading and practicing the presence of God. The presence of God is our hope. And that, I believe, is why our psalm, chosen for today, talks about that in verse 2. Let my vindication come forth from your what? Your presence. Our vindication comes from God's presence in our lives. That means that as we practice the presence of God all the time, we'll be right where we should be, and things will go just as they should. This is such a loving community. I'm very glad to be back with you with my therapy dog in training. His name is Arthur. You will see him in sore points. And if you're wondering where that picture of the Bishop of Florida came, no, I have no interest in living in Central Florida. I will say that. But it was a great visit. And the bishop took a selfie, and I said, send it to Sword Point, because that's what we do around here now. Selfies with the Father. It wasn't my 
my idea, but hey, I'm going with the book. <laughs> so that's my story. That's where that picture and source points came from, if you saw it. And let me conclude with some words that are monastic. I said I would talk about something monastic. And I was actually on an Episcopal Church blog last night, reading some comments. And some comments were posted by a monk who was also an Episcopal priest who's in his 80s. And they really gripped me. And they spoke to me about how we live as those who practice the presence of God. And I'll conclude with this. After 57 years in the priesthood, I want to plainly say that you will do nothing. Whatever form of value is done is done by God. You can't save an alien parish. God can. You can't comfort the torn and battered. God can. You can't preach inspiring sermons. God can. The key is simply to lose yourself inside of God. Listen to these Eucharistic words. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. And spend at least a third of your time in silent, wordless, acceptable, and utterly vulnerable prayer. To paraphrase the gospel, speak God first.